Hi everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, uh, today we have Ognjen Rudovic, he is uh, finishing his uh, Marie Curie Fellowship at uh, MIT in the Media Lab. Um, and before that he was a graduate student at Imperial College in London, right? And, and this um, fellowship all, all is uh, paid or, or organized by European Union and MIT, so he spent some time in Europe and some time in MIT uh, while doing this. Uh, his research in grad school was started with computer vision, I assume, became yeah. very quickly machine learning in general. He's worked on Gaussian processes, deep learning, reinforcement learning, uh, uh, multimodal uh, data analysis. Um, and uh, today he'll talk about personalized machine learning uh, in case of a very interesting case of uh, uh, helping doctors track uh, treatment of autistic children. Uh, which uh, presents very interesting uh, 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 problems with domain transfer, meta-learning uh, on one side and the other side, uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, uh, and uh, I'll just let him talk all, uh, all about this. Hopefully he's <clears throat> not gonna talk about everything he's ever done because he's done a lot for somebody <laughs> who's just finishing his postdoc. Uh, and he'll focus on uh, one or two things that uh, he's done most recently. So, yeah. Ogden, take uh, over. Thank you, Namisha, for the introduction. And, uh... Can you hear me well? Yeah. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you all for coming. So, well, Nebusha helped me skip the first slide, because, but I will just walk you through to get some uh, nice uh, pictures here. So I did uh, my uh, uh, bachelor's degree in automatic control theory at the University of Belgrade. Then I did a master's in computer vision, uh, PhD in computer science at the Imperial College in London where I focus on Gaussian processes and uh, sequential learning, mostly conditional random fields models. And then uh, now I'm doing a postdoc in the final stage of my uh, Marie Curie Fellowship, where I work on, on deep learning, reinforcement learning uh, for uh, human data. And I will show you what exactly I mean by this. So and this is my little fellow that I collaborated with mostly in the last two years. So in my talk, I will focus first on my previous work uh, that is mostly concerned with facial behavior analysis. And this is something that I did uh, during my PhD and uh, in the first year as a postdoc at Imperial College. Then uh, I'll talk about robot-assisted autism therapy. And um, I'll use this as a use case for the uh, modeling that I'm trying to do in terms of personalized machine learning. Uh, then I will describe the, the technical background on the personalized deep networks that I worked on over the last two years. And uh, hopefully we'll have time to go into other, some, to cover some other methods that I worked on and that uh, as a span like a more general human data uh, analysis and uh, personalization techniques. And uh, there I will see, uh, show and talk about my vision, how I would approach the other challenges in personalized machine learning. So when modeling uh, human uh, facial behavior, so what is the main reason uh, for uh, doing it? So we have many uh, applications like for human-robot interaction, uh, like therapy, pain monitoring, gaming, uh, in vehicle computing, and also like a human-computer interaction where we want to detect a certain cognitive and emotional states. And face is one of the most powerful channels of our nonverbal behavior. And uh, that's why we want to encode like how people express their emotion and these states through facial expressions. And using computer vision and machine learning, we can do that. So, but before that, we need to establish some standards here. So how do we uh, describe faces? And there are two general approaches. One is the message judgment, which is more subjective and uh, relies on our perception of emotion and cognitive states. And, uh, the old-fashioned approach is to use the categorical approach when we classify emotions into basic categories. But also there is a dimensional approach where we can use a more fine-grained scale in terms of valence, uh, which means how positive or negative emotion is, or arousal, how what is the level of excitement. And then there is still this like a mapping from the categorical to the dimensional approach. So these are different metrics that we would use to describe faces. Also, there is a more objective way uh, that could allow us to build a face gamma, and these are facial action units. And those are the activations of the facial muscles that enables us to capture all the variety that we can uh, express with our faces. And uh, going even a step further, we can encode their intensity. And as you can imagine, like a, um, 
here we have more than 32 facial action units, and then for each we have like more than five intensity levels. So the problem of uh, like facial expression recognition, it may seem similar on the outside, because uh, like expressing faces, simple emotions, we can recognize that using the, 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 the basic computer vision. But if you look at this problem, this is more than just uh, recognizing basic emotion categories. Here we have a multitask learning. We have a distribution of different uh, intensity levels of multiple tasks that we want to model, where each task is a different action unit. So, and also there is a, we can always use this uh, uh, sign judgment approach to go back to the perception approach where we want to map action units into emotion categories. But overall, uh, <clears throat> so what I worked on in the past was like given different uh, problems like uh, static images, multi-view images, and image sequences, I worked on different machine learning and computer vision techniques in order to achieve what is in the output, recognition of the, emo <coughs> of the emotion category or the action units uh, or their intensities. So now I will just show you snapshots of the techniques that I worked on. I won't go into more detail because I will focus later on the technical parts uh, of the personalized networks that I want to, uh, to introduce here. So one of the methods that worked was like a discriminative Gaussian processes uh, where we use the data from multiple views to find the bedding in which we classify the emotions and then uh, whatever view the person comes from, uh, the person's face comes from, we can do uh, classification of that face in the common space. Then recently I worked with um, my PhD students at Imperial College on a combination of deep convolutional networks and non-parametric models like Gaussian processes where we found a very powerful combination here uh, using convolutional networks to act as feature extractors of uh, different uh, uh, parts of the face while embedding those into a low-dimensional space using Gaussian processes and the uh, autoencoders to estimate uh, intensity of uh, facial action units. Then uh, I worked on the conditional random field models, which uh, which uh, where I extended the, 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 the standard conditional random field uh, models for sequence <laughs> modeling by introducing a latent variables that encode the relationships between different action unit intensities. And uh, those relationships are encoded using ordinal variables, where you know the level three is always higher than level two. So this information is very important if you want to constrain the model when predicting different intensities of facial action units. <coughs> and finally, this is uh, uh, one work that uh, <coughs> where we try to combine multiple data sets, where each of the data sets had a limited number of annotated action units, and some of them were overlapping across two different data sets. Uh, and what we wanted to have in the end is a model that can, given a new data set, recognize all the union of the action units that existed in the training data. And for that, we used, <coughs> we formulated this as a, as a problem of modeling multiple distributions of action units and their intensities, where we use the couple of functions which are uh, very powerful uh, uh, statistical uh, uh, descriptors that model uh, dependencies between the pairs of marginal distributions. So by using these techniques, I, I managed to, to, to build the networks and the different models that could automatically recognize action units and their intensities from face images. However, while I, I was still, and I'm still excited about that work, I, I, uh, I was looking for something that would uh, help me explore how these techniques work in the real world, moving beyond the standardized data sets where we build a model, uh, uh, test, our mo test it on the data set, and then achieve the state of the art, and we move forward to the next uh, data set. So what I did, I, when I started my fellowship, I, started, I focused on the autism therapy, where we have a, a real challenge of a, of a therapist working with a kid and using a robot as an assistive tool and trying to use the tool to engage the kid in the therapy content. So just to give you some ideas, what is it like? So this is an example of the, of the therapy that I <laughs> so 
So we have a, a robot here. Maybe we can stop. So what you saw there is uh, like the robot that was used as a assistive tool uh, to engage the kid in the therapy and also uh, um, teach the kid the uh, expressions of typical emotion categories like happiness, sadness, joy, and so, and so on. Uh, but what is uh, the reason for using robots here? I would like to motivate that first before I move into the technical part. So robots provide this uh, safe uh, environment for the kids with autism. Uh, and, uh, one of the main challenges that we have when working with kids uh, with autism is how to maintain and sustain uh, like their engagement levels. They easily lose engagement in the task, and that it makes it very difficult for a therapist to to proceed with the uh, with the learning uh, materials. So we want to have uh, these tools that can keep the engagement of the kids uh, keep the kids engaged during this therapy in order to improve their learning. But also there is another very important aspect of of having this kind of uh, hardware or like assistive tools uh, uh, in, in, in the therapy. Uh, it doesn't have to be ro robots, it can be any other kind of uh, like a multi-sensory uh, hardware. Uh, it can augment the therapist by monitoring the behavioral cues of the kid and summarizing those cues at the end so that the therapist can uh, see, okay, this approach worked for this kid, it didn't work for this kid, so this kid was more engaged with this therapy part than the other. So we can derive like a personalized therapy content, which is critical for uh, learning outcomes. So, <clears throat> in order... Mm -hmm. in this setting, uh, previous one, only the therapist woman is the therapist. Yes, so the woman is the therapist uh, uh, working with this kid. So, so traditionally, uh, the therapy would proceed uh, uh, with the therapist and the kid working using like the, the face images, and then the therapist uh, showing, okay, this is when the, uh, what the person looks like when he's happy or sad or angry, and then the kid would need in the next stage to recognize, to pick up some images when the person describes a certain emotional state. But here we have a robot that is doing the, the role of actively participating in teaching of these emotional responses, but also passively collecting the data and enabling us to later analyze what were the behavioral patterns expressed during this therapy content. How long are the sessions? So uh, I'll mention that here. So the sessions were 25 minutes long uh, on average. So this was like a one-off recording of 25 minutes uh, uh, sessions between <coughs> in this like a, a triads, the therapist kid and the robot. <coughs> we had the camera placed behind the robot. So all this data is uh, recorded uh, at two autism centers, one in Japan and the other one in Serbia. So I went there with, uh, uh, with my colleague from Japan and we, we used uh, now robot and we had a platform for data recording where we synchronized all these uh, like multi-model recordings that we did, which included the robot's camera, then the audio, the audio recordings, as well as the <coughs> autonomic physiological data that we gathered using the Empathica's uh, 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 wristband that was worn by the therapist and the kid. So this kind of therapy is more like a speech therapy or occupational therapy? So it is a, a standard educational therapy, it's a, a oh, emotional oh, therapy, oh, yes. Yeah. Typical OP therapy. Yes, so it's a standardized therapy that would be done uh, in the in case of uh, uh, for the kids with autism, uh, using as I mentioned earlier, like this kind of uh, images. The, where we have, uh, oops. I know that you already have uh, in in US one. There were typical programs for such therapy. Yes, so it's Other ABBA program, uh, like. Uh, so this therapy program is designed particularly. Uh, with the robot, or it's, uh, such as channel? No, so this is a, uh, like a standardized program uh -huh. that uh, would be performed by the therapist even without the presence of the robot. Okay. Uh, the robot uh, was used here as a, just additional tool that was uh, used to, uh, to demonstrate some parts of the therapy. Was it meant to increase the engagement? Was it so the, the, that was uh, uh, something that we wanted uh, to see in the beginning, whether the robot would increase the engagement and maintain the engagement of the kids. So what we had is <coughs> we, we, the therapist also had access to the keypad where, from where 
he or she was, she in this case, was controlling the robot. So when the kid was, uh, got disengaged, the therapist could press a certain button and the, the robot would do something and the kid would e easily re-engage in the therapy. The coding you mentioned here, 25 minute long therapy sessions, that's, that's a normal uh, treatment? Even yeah. So this is they would still have a uh, videotaped session and they would go through it afterwards to see what the engagement was like? And that's one yeah. of the most uh, difficult parts that the, that the therapists are facing uh, uh, when analyzing the content of the therapy. So what they do, they, they record all these uh, therapies. So this therapy can be 25 minutes uh, on, a, on a daily basis. So if you think of this like a, uh, on a monthly basis, it will be hours of videos. But what the therapists uh, do is they watch these videos after each therapy, and then they uh, try to see, okay, these are the segments when the kid goes engaged or disengaged, and they manually annotate this. So, so what you see like with the therapist doing here, it's only 25 minutes. The work that it takes after this to analyze this data, it takes them hours. So you can multiply everything by, by five or ten times of the real time they spend in the actual uh, therapy. So that's another reason why we wanted to, to have tools that can automate this process and assist the therapist. At least give them some suggestions. Okay, these are the interesting segments of the video and, uh, to, to focus on, to do some filtering. So in the... And overall, so I didn't say here... So our main goal here is like using this multimodal data <coughs> of the, the therapy sessions, we want to make personalized estimation of the affect and engagement levels uh, of the kids within the uh, uh, participating in this therapy. And the engagement, uh, what I mean here, is uh, like how engaged the kid is in the task with the robot. So the therapists were given a, 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 a list of rules how to rate these engagement levels based uh, on the part of the therapy but also uh, valence and arousal were used as measures of affect, and they introduced them. Valence, well, how positive or negative emotion of the kid is, and uh, arousal, how excited uh, the kid is in the, during the therapy. Okay, so a uh, system, like overall design of the system that we use in human-robot interaction could be in a simplified way, presented like this. So we do the data sense sensing, then we have perception and interaction module. So we wa want to go to this <coughs> pipeline from the beginning to the end to explore, to use the data, to do some reasoning about this uh, using machine learning or computer vision algorithms or together, and then inform the robot about the cognitive and emotional state of the kid. And then here we have different interaction strategies designed that based on those inputs, I'll enable the robot to respond in a, in a socially appropriate way and socially intelligent way during the therapy. So what I'm going to focus on here is the perception part. So, so I just want to clarify. So the, the, proce and the therapy process is uh, the, the robot, the role of the robot is, is to like, uh, uh, only observe the, the emotions of the kids. They don't, they don't like, react. Yeah, exactly. So uh, in, in this example that I'm showing here, the, the robots are only observing, and they're uh, controlled by the therapist. And, and the list of their, uh, like how, how, or the instruction for the therapist to, um, to like press a button, how to press or, or whatever. Yeah, so the therapists were instructed uh, uh, about the functionalities uh, of the robot, and those functionalities were designed based on the, on the therapist's suggestions. So what the therapist would like to have in the, in the uh, while they are doing the therapy. So for example, <coughs> one was like, okay, if the therapist presses the, uh, the button one, the robot shows the expression of happiness. So they, were, they had like a clear, like a <coughs> on the keypad we denoted all these like different emotional categories and other activities like waving at the kids, saying something to the kids, things that would re-engage the kid in the therapy. Okay. So the, the first step in processing uh, on, uh, of all this data is uh, to perform the data sensing. And for that, we used um, uh, open source tools. Uh, in terms of the autonomic physiology data, we used the uh, Empathicus E4 uh, wristband that pro uh, gave us the, the readings of electrodermal activity, which is the, the measure of the autonomic uh, arousal. Then uh, body temperature, heart rate, also the accelerometer and the 
blood volume pulse uh, data. So we processed th this data using uh, other tools that uh, we developed in the lab. Then also we used the open face uh, tool for extraction of the facial features, uh, like uh, the head pose, facial points, facial action units, uh, and also their intensity. And uh, we used the open pose uh, tool for tracking the, the body uh, joints. And all this was perform uh, applied uh, the video and the trend in the near real time. And we used, uh, for audio descriptors, we used the open smile tool that gave us uh, the 24 low level audio descriptors of the conversations that were performed between the therapist and the kid. <clears throat> we did the segmentation uh, later of, uh, of the audio content that belong, uh, that belong only to the kid to, to do the user uh, separation. So th this is a one very important part of, uh, of the data processing that we used uh, to, to, to build a later machine learning system for automatic estimation of engagement. Yeah. Do you also track the facial expressions of the therapist? Yes, uh, we did, but we didn't include that uh, in this uh, study because here we focused only on the engagement expressions of the kid. But yeah, we have this data and also autonomic physiology data of the therapist as well. Yeah. And that was envisioned as the next step to analyze the synchrony between the kid and the therapist and also engagement of both in the, with the robot. So, we, uh, so this is one of the typical tasks that uh, therapists would do uh, after the therapy, as I mentioned earlier. They would watch this audio with uh, visual recordings and then uh, uh, associate uh, to them uh, estimations of valence, arousal, engagement, and uh, try to find those most interesting segments. So what we did here, after we recorded all the data, we asked five human therapists who were not participating in this therapy uh, to look at those audiovisual recordings and provide uh, continuous estimations on the scale from minus one and one using a joystick of how, uh, uh, what were the valence arousal and engagement level of this kid uh, during the, the, the therapy. We combine these annotations uh, doing some, uh, uh, by applying the techniques for the sequence uh, synchronization and uh, uh, in order to obtain the single ground truth for, from all these five therapists. So they're controlling with the joystick, they're controlling these three, uh, three things, you said? So each of these uh, annotations were done uh, independently. Oh, independently. So with yeah. the joystick, they're just going up and down. And say, up and down for each metric. Payments. I see. Yeah. yeah, they go through the video three times. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit, uh, it's a very laborious thing to, uh, to do, and uh, uh, that's another motivation why we want to automate this uh, process. Okay, so in uh, traditional machine learning, how we would approach this problem is that we would have a, uh, we would take all the data of all the kids, then perform some feature extraction, apply a predictive model, and then in the output we have the, for example, engagement estimation. But what is uh, uh, the main assumption in this uh, approach? Uh, we want to maximize the performance, uh, the average performance for all the kids. So this uh, approach doesn't allow us to focus on each individual, but it would just take all the kids and treat them as a single domain. But as we know, kids with autism uh, are very different between themselves. So every kid has a different uh, and uh, very unique ways of expressing their engagement and uh, affective states. So treating them as a single domain can be a bit misleading and uh, not optimal in this case, but also in the case of general population where every person has individual differences that set us apart and uh, <clears throat> building one approach for everyone may not be the optimal solution. So I will uh, show you here a few examples why, uh, what is the consequence of these uh, differences? So imagine we are trying to build a, like a classifier that tries to classify neutral from expressive faces from some training set of individuals, and we find that for those individuals this is the optimal decision boundary. What happens when we have a new individual that the uh, generic classifier is not optimal anymore because the date of this individual falls into a different region in this uh, classification subspace. So what we want is a way to shift this generic classifier towards this ideal classifier for this test subject. Because in the end, what we are interested in is how well we perform on this new subject. So this is another 
a challenge that uh, comes from this uh, heterogeneity uh, in the data that we are dealing with when working with, uh, uh, for example, in this case, kids with autism. What you see here, this two-dimensional space is a projection of the, multi, of the high-dimensional multimodal data, which is audiovisual recordings and the autonomic physiology data and, uh, of, of these kids. So what we did, we used all their like, uh, sequence of data and then applied <coughs> TSNE, which is an unsupervised humanality reduction technique that tries to find the low-dimensional, in this case, two-dimensional embeddings of, the, of this high-dimensional dim, data. Ah, and for each kid. What is important here is that this, class, uh, this clustering, this projection is done in unsupervised way. And what you can see here is, so all these points are the points that belong to one single frame of those kids. And if you notice this clustering effect, then you will see that each kid is some, forms a, a little cluster in this subspace. And this evidence is what is the level of heterogeneity that we are dealing with here. And if you, if you think about building a, a classifier that will work in this part of the space, it won't be able to generalize uh, if you get the data from the kids that come from the other space of this subspace. This is another uh, sign of, of differences that we are dealing with uh, when working with the human data. Uh, what, you, what you see here are distributions of the annotations that we obtained for this data. For example, in this case, we have the uh, arousal and valence, uh, which where arousal is excitement level, valence is how positive or negative is the emotion for the kids, for all the kids that we use in this study, and for whom we got the annotations by human coders. So this distribution is the distribution of these uh, two dimensions of uh, annotations for both cultures. But what happens when we plot these distributions on the individual level? We completely get different distribution patterns. So it, meaning, it means if we build like a population level model, it would focus on modeling in the output this kind of distributions. What happens when we go to the individual level, when we want to apply this classifier, we are dealing with a completely different and as evident here, multimodal distributions. So that classifier won't be optimal anymore when applied to this kind of data. And uh, something that, although we didn't ask the kids with autism to report their engagement levels, but what we uh, usually face as uh, uh, another challenge in uh, working with the human data is, the, is how we report our uh, emotional and cognitive states, for example, uh, in the case of pain, we have multiple metrics. So one is self-rating, which is user-centered. So pain, very high pain for one person may mean completely different for another person. And then we have observer rating, where someone uh, external is watching us, for example, our facial expressions, and is reporting uh, what pain we are experiencing. So these are all subjective metrics. We also have phase that from phase selection units, we can apply some uh, formula uh, to obtain the pain level. But what I'm trying to communicate here is that we have multiple ways to encode the same phenomena that we want to model. And this varies a lot between uh, uh, individuals. So ideally, what we are interested in is, is a system that would allow us to, to, to handle these differences by focusing on maximization of the performance for each of these individuals. And so what, uh, in order to, to tackle this, that I worked on the design of a deep neural network that would uh, encode these individual differences by having a hierarchical structure. So I'll start from the top level. So what we have here. So here we have, as an input, different modalities, visual, audio, and uh, physiological, where we apply. So each of these, I don't know if this would work. So each of these layers is one layer in a, a deep neural network. And what we have in, uh, at the, the top part is autoencoders that take as input the features that are very noisy, try to 
uh, encode them into lower dimensional subspace. And then we perform the fusion of this feature at the, uh, something that we call the context layer. So well, why is this the context layer? Here we do the segmentation of the kids and their uh, network structure based on different meta metadata, like their culture, gender, and the ID number. But also we include uh, something that's called CARS. It's a child's autism rating scale. So this is the rating of 15 dimensional uh, scale by the doctors uh, that say, OK, this kid is this much uh, uh, verbal, or this is uh, uh, what is the motor ability. These are motor abilities of that kid, and so on. So it gives us some very strong prior about these kids. And finally, at the individual level, what we are trying to do is, like once we build the whole structure of the network, we are making the predictions for that uh, specific kid. So I will now introduce uh, the, the technical part of this network. So for that, I will first define the learning operators that uh, I use to, 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 to build the network. So the first one is autoencoders, where we have <laughs> the encoding of the input and the uh, deco decoding in the original space. But also, this is accompanied with a companion function, which is making sure that the, the embeddings that we get here, H0, are also <coughs> a good proxy of the output phenomena that we want to model. In this case, engagement, valence, and arousal metric. For that, we use the, the linear activation layers. Then there is another one that's called the uh, learn uh, uh, operator, which is a connection of the 1D player uh, followed by the regression layer that is estimating uh, the output metrics, valence, arousal, and engagement. And for the D player, we use the rectifying linear units uh, because of the problem of the vanishing gradient. So we wanted to have more robust model there. And this is uh, basically the, the, the function that we used for uh, Training these individual like uh, layers in the sequence, like two, two, every time, two layers at a time. So the first part is encoding the mean squared error of the of the predicting the certain the target outcomes. The other one is the encoding uh, part of our input features. So this is one interesting operator. It's called nesting. So one, so uh, because the idea is that we do this sequential learning of the network. So we learn one layer at a time, then we nest another layer, which is a replica of that layer, and then we relearn that uh, layer, uh, that, that layer, by opti by optimizing only its own its parameters by freezing the parameters above, and then cloning is the final. Uh, operator that uh, uh, we use here is, and what it basically does is when we have this one layer in the network and we want to split the kids based on their gender, we need to replicate that layer horizontally so that it can focus on the males and females. And we do that by taking the same layer that was learned jointly for these two groups and then by, after replicating, we initiate the parameters of each layer using the parameters of the original layer. So how the, the, the learning proceeds here? So we start with a group level network, which has multiple layers. So the first one is encoding layer, then is the fusion layer, uh, then the culture, gender, individual uh, layer, and the, the final individual layer is for prediction of the target outcomes, valence, arousal, and engagement. So what we do first, <clears throat> we start by learning the, the first layer in the network, where uh, x is the input multimodal data encoded, uh, uh, as I showed in the previous example. Then we learn only those, these two layers. Once we learn these two layers, we freeze them, and then we perform the nesting of the next pair of the layers. Then we freeze those, uh, we learn those layers, we freeze them, and we perform another nesting. And so on. And that's how we go all the way to the bottom uh, of this network until we reach the individual level. And the parameter optimization is again done using the mean squared error as a loss. 
But what is uh, very important here is that once we do all this layer-wise training, which we found that is that the benefits from two things. The first one is that by having these companion functions here, make sure that as we go deeper in the network, that we are preserving this discriminative information about the outcomes that we want to model. Another important thing is that after we have trained the whole network, it is really needed to do one final pass to synchronize all the parameters in the network by fine-tuning them jointly. And this is done in the, ste the second step uh, of the learning of the group network. So once we have this group network, the next step is to, to form the personalized network without any further learning. So what happens here, we have the group level network. We can discard all these companion functions that were used. You can think of them as regularizers that were used during the training of the network. So once we have this group level network this, this is, that is well initialized, what we do, we do the personalization using the cloning operator. So we come to the culture level, we split it into two parts by replicating this layer, then we go to the gender layer, and then we keep splitting it all the way to the individual level. And this is a kind of uh, structure that we arrive at. It's, it has a tree like, it's like a binary tree uh, structure. And once we have initialized this network for, uh, for all the kids in the data set, there are two very important steps that are needed uh, in order to make this work. The, f the, the, the first step is called the fine tune one. So what we do there is <clears throat> now that we have this new structure, we need to fine tune it for each individual kid. But the first attempt that we did was, okay, let's take the data of this one kid, pass the data through that specific branch that leads for the input to that kid, fine tune it, and then move to the next kid. Once we did that, we realized this doesn't work at all. It would overfit each kid at a time, so it would completely uh, diminish the influence of the other layers, and <coughs> it would leave other kids completely, it wouldn't work for the other kids. So <coughs> what we did then, we said, okay, instead of optimizing this, uh, using all the data of that kid, let's do the random sampling of the paths from the input to the to to the node of that specific kid, and using only a few examples. So basically, what we did, we did a sampling. Okay, uh, one sample of that kid, do a pass with the stochastic gradient descent, then take another kid, do a sampling of the of the sub path of that kid. So for example, if you are doing for for this kid here, then one example could be optimizing only this and this layer using uh, the data of that kid. And then we would do this randomization with the stochastic gradient descent until we would explore the data of all the kids that we had for training. Once this part was done, and, uh-huh. Can you sampling the, uh, the levels or? The levels, yeah. So you can think of this uh, like from the input to the output as a chain. And uh, on that chain, we are sampling subchains, and then freezing everything else in the network and allowing the network to fine tune only those uh, parts. Yeah. So th th is this scalable to the number of, like, if you increase the number of uh, people in your data set? If, if I increase the number of? The number of individuals. Yes. So. Well, it depends uh, what, is the kind, uh, what is the network structure you would like to design. So it depends how many factors you have. Like learning one joint network shouldn't be, uh, uh, the complexity would depend only on the depth of the network that we would like to have. But in the end, it depends how many individuals you have here. What is a very nice property of this network is that we can learn different parts of the network in different sites and then merge the network, and with additional steps to the fine tuning, get a, get the global network, and then decompose again, and send uh, to the uh, to to the original sites. Uh, I, th I have that part in the future work. If you if you make it there, so I will show you how uh, some ideas how we would do that using decentralized learning. I guess the question is: Is this does this grow exponentially with the number of children or linearly? Uh, well, it, it depends on the depth. So. So it depends on what are the intermediate factors that we have here. 
for example, in this case, we're modeling uh, culture and uh, age. So depending on uh, how, how many factors yeah, we have. It goes exponentially with that, maybe, with the factors. But with, with individual children, it seems that it's linear. It, it is uh, uh, it's linear in the number of the, of the kids. But uh, if you think of this as a binary trees, uh -huh. that's, uh, then it will have like a, a logarithmic uh, complexity. In order to, to, yeah. to reach the... Because you're doing subchains? Subchains, yeah. In the second step, so in the fine-tune uh, two parts, what we have, uh, <coughs> which is, again, very important, is once we have uh, tuned the, the network parameters, we need to go through every single kit and do the final fine-tuning. However, here we are safe because these parameters, or these two layers, depend only on that kit. So we are allowed to, to fine-tune them as much as we like because they won't affect the other kids in the network. Sorry, mm -hmm. just clarify. On the left-hand side, this neural network is developed for all the kids, right? Yeah, so this is for all the kids. For all the kids. And this one is also for all the kids. It's the all same network. With the kids' specific layers. So Yeah, so, all, so these two are uh, layers that are specific for the kid K. For example, so it will be k. Oh. So it will be k. Yes. Yeah. So if we, I think, so, so this is the, the network uh, uh, that we have in the end. So what you saw, those two layers would fall uh, under this kid, and then, depending on how many layers we would have here and the kids, th that would uh, affect the network structure. Okay, and so the, the, here are some results about like uh, the learning performance of the network. And the, what we see here is that, okay, so here I compared three types of models. The the one is the, as the baseline is the multi-layer perceptron that was trained without this sequential learning. It was trained all the layers uh, simultaneously. Uh, then uh, the global uh, the, the group uh, the group network that was used to initialize the personalized network was uh, is shown in red, and then the personalized network uh, uh, is this one. So what we are seeing here is the this gap in the error reduction during the training. So this shows us that that due to the flexibility of the personalized network, we can fine tune. Uh, the network parameters are better to the target kids. And, and what we also see here is that compared to the standard uh, multi-layer perceptron, we still get the benefit of training, training these layers sequentially. So if you look at the, at the results that we, uh, that we get here uh, for the personalized network uh, and, uh, and the gr group level network, uh, these are the intra-class correlation coefficients that uh, we use as the, as the performance metric. And it me measures what is the, the consistency or agreement between the model predictions and the ground truth provided by the human labelers. Uh, so the scores range between 52 and 65. And one thing you can notice there is that there is a high variance. And this is because these results are obtained by averaging over all the kits that we have in the data set. So we computed the individual performance, and then we averaged those. So this is another indicator of the high heterogeneity in this, uh, uh, in this population. However, so we see that there are clear improvements over the group level network, which are more pronounced. If you, if you look at this metric that uh, I call it the task rank, it means if we we're comparing on how many different tasks this model was performing better than the other. Uh, th this is the percentage. So in 46.5% uh, of cases, the personalized model was outperforming all these other models that were used here. And each task is defined, uh, as I mentioned there, like for each kit, we have three outputs, which is valence, arousal, and engagement. So it would be 105 tasks in total. Um, so what prediction are you predicting on young kids? If they are new, how do you know they are individual? 
parameters for your training model? Ah, so we, we know the ID of each kid when we are doing the predictions. Okay, so you know the ID, but when you train the data, these new kids are not seeing it. So the, that's a... Uh, 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 that's another uh, problem that we have here, a limitation that I will talk about. Uh, so this network is a subject dependent, so we need to have all the kids uh, present during the learning of the network. Okay. And uh, the way we, we did the learning here is uh, we did a split uh, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the kids' data into training, validation, test uh, uh, set, but the data of each kid was present in all these subsets here. So it's a subject-dependent model. Oh, okay. And uh, there is a, so uh, here, uh, what we also have is a, okay, personalized multilayer perceptron. This is a child-dependent multilayer perceptron. So it is a multilayer perceptron trained only on the, on the data of that kid. Uh, linear regression, support vector regression, gradient boosted regression trees are the baselines that we, that we use here. As we can see, the linear regression underperforms significantly here. But what is interesting is that uh, the performance that we get uh, in the leave one child out experiment. So we train the network, and then we apply this network as an assembly learning method, where we would have multiple kids in the output. So we assume that this, uh, this kid is uh, uh, it's a new kid that comes to the therapy. And then we don't know what is the culture or gender, for example. And we just take the predictions by all the, the models at the bottom layer and average them, and this is the performance that we we'll get. So, uh, showing that these models, without knowing this, uh, like a meta structure, metadata about a specific kid, or not having access to any uh, data of, of this kid in terms of <coughs> like behavioral data to fine tune the network layers, would result in a very low performance. Questions here. So, so regarding that last thing, could you uh, see which model agrees with uh, the, the human rate is the most on that child and infer the gender and the culture and uh, and so on and find the children that are similar to each other? Yeah. Well, the, yeah, that's interesting. We haven't tried that. We haven't tried uh, 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 that kind of analysis to look uh, to classify the kids based on the agreement with the human coders. But there's uh, uh, one. One interesting thing that we were thinking about, how we can do this clustering automatically. So uh, to, to find the structure uh, that would be optimal in terms of the variance of, of, of each kid, data variance for each kid in, the, in different levels of the model hierarchy. But one of the reasons why we did uh, the network structure, we designed the network in this way, because we wanted to also have space for inter interpretability of the network, which was very important uh, for the for the therapies, they wanted uh, to see, like, uh, uh, we used uh, one method uh, that I described in the paper uh, that we published, uh, where we published this work. Actually, we published, uh, this is the first work that was published in uh, science robotics on a human-robot interaction. And uh, we showed there that we can analyze, uh, by analyzing the, the outputs of different layers, we can see the, what are the individual differences at the cultural level and the gender level. And we showed that, that in terms of the, in the expression of engagement, the Japanese kids, when they were highly engaged, they were uh, very, very still. While the, the, the Serbs, while they were highly engaged, they were v very moving around a lot. We found that from the activation of the network layers, by analyzing their gradients, we, we, we noticed these individual differences, which were very interesting to, to show that there, this cultural uh, components that differ a lot between these two groups. So the question regarding the previous question, why can't you just take a new child and add, add, add the child as a leaf in the tree and there's just train that last layer? Yes, so we, we can. So we can include, uh, so if you want to extend this. If you have a little bit of data, so, so the doctor would label a new child for 25 minutes or whatever, and yeah. they would, you would just add it to your model as the one more leaf. Yeah, so they the, have a model for their child so that they don't have to label anymore. So that's the, the main potential of this model, that we can uh, easily incorporate a new kid by knowing the metadata of that kid. So if you know the culture and gender of the new kid, 
But it's not just the culture and gender. You have your individual, individual kids, so you do have to have some training data to, to train that last player. Yes, so we, we, we must have uh, the, this uh, last, uh, the data to train the last player. Uh, but the, the, the good point, uh, uh, I mean, the advantage of having the pre-trained model is that uh, when we have a new kid that we want to include in the network, we don't need to uh, a lot of data of that new kid because the model is already pre-trained on the upper layers. So what we only need to fine-tune is the last layer of that kid. So uh, we haven't uh, explored this in, in this work. Uh, yeah, so there's a plan uh, to go in th this direction because uh, exactly like growing this network, how we can take advantage of this uh, pre-trained network and then easily include the new kids. So that, that would be one of the main benefits here. So the other question is, what is interclass correlation? These things that you're modeling are real valued outputs, they're not classes. So, so how do you compute that, compute that interclass correlation? So, inter <coughs> so for each uh, uh, individual, uh, so we have, uh, like, uh, in image sequences, we have the, uh, the frames. For each frame, we get the estimates uh, for valence, arousal, and engagement, which are continuous estimates. And then we have uh, the corresponding estimates that are uh, labels that are given by human labelers. Oh, I see. see yeah. See. So we compute. The, so the, you can think of this as a, a person correlation, but uh, only it's, uh, it takes uh, into account uh, uh, the, 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 the bias that may exist between the... So what does 52 mean? When you have 52, what does that mean? So, uh, so this, uh, so this uh, uh, measure rate goes from 0 to 100. So the higher, the better. So if we reach 100, so it means there is a perfect agreement so between... the amount of variance you explain? Yeah. So, so, as I, okay. so this is the... So it is the, the model of variance that is exp explained. So it, is, it takes into account the variance between the annotators which in this case, the model is one annotator and the, the real annotator is another one. So it takes into account their variance. So they, it's, we want to, to see what is the level, uh, what is the amount of variance that cannot be explained by this. And w one interesting observation here is that when we computed the between human raters agreement uh, uh, on, on this data, we reached uh, the levels between 50 and 55% for all these uh, measures, while we, with, the, with the model that we that we designed, we reached fifty nine percent. So it doesn't mean that this model is better than humans. The uh, the point here at, uh, that is uh, very important is that the model is being uh, more consistent with the ground truth labels than we achieved to to uh, to get between the humans. So if you have two humans annotating, their consistency levels uh, would range fifty to fifty five percent. What we achieved with this model was 59%, showing that we can have a highly consistent uh, estimates. But there's a wide, wide range. There's a, uh, there is a large range that depends on the kids. The kids that really do well and kids that you don't do well on. So I'll, I'll show that uh, uh, here. So th this is the performance that we uh, get on the individual level, which is very important when analyzing the, the personalized models. And uh, here we have the, the difference in the interclass correlation between the uh, personalized model and the population level model. And these are the improvements oops, uh, for the kids. So what we see here, stuck here. So for majority of the kids, we have uh, large improvements in the terms of the interclass correlation. However, on some, and this is most pronounced on the engagement metric. Uh, However, what, what happens is that there is a, also the side effect here that we have the negative transfer. For some kids, uh, we underperform after the personalization. And when we looked into the data of these kids, what we found is for these kids, the model, uh, we either didn't have enough variety in the data in terms of their engagement levels. So they were either all the time disengaged or highly engaged. Or we had a, only like a, a, f a, few, a few data. I mean, a few data, meaning that uh, in, the, in, the, in the therapies that we recorded, th there were many cases where the, the, we had a problem with missing data. So some of the modalities would completely be absent. So the kid would move that much that we couldn't have a face present in most of the frames. Then the kid would ta take the, the watch uh, during the recording. So all the physiological data would be gone. So we would lo lose a lot of data. So, and that's one of the motivations why we use autoencoders in the input trying to get uh, to somehow compensate for this uh, missing data. But 
in the extreme cases, uh, uh, we couldn't handle that well. But this is something that is very important, and I will try to speed. Uh, so what we see here uh, is the empirical uh, cumulative density function, which gives us another view at the error that we are measuring here. So our uh, uh, error in terms of the interclass correlation can go from 0 to 1. So what you're seeing on the x-axis is 1 minus uh, interclass correlation for each kid. And here is the empirical CDF that we're getting, which is the distribution of these errors. And the main point here is that for the personalized model, we have this gray line here, which is showing us, OK, what is the distribution of the errors in the personalized model compared to the population level model? And if you look at this part here, we see that when the errors are very small, meaning when the model is doing well, there is not much benefit in personalization. So if you have a model that is doing already very well on that kid or on or this group of the kids, personalization won't improve it much. And when we have a model that is completely failing on these kids, which could be like we have wrong assumptions about the model that we apply to these kids, then again, it's very challenging and difficult to, to personalize that model to get some benefits with personalization. But where is the most space for improvement is in this intermediate range when the model is uncertain about that kit, but with a little bit of boost, it can perform much better. And finally, I would like to show you, so here, uh, that by using different modalities, we get uh, uh, additional improvements. So we, we personalized only the face, body, audio, and physiological data when training this model. And uh, this is the model that uh, uses all these different modalities. One thing that we can observe here, yes, there is a very high variance, again, because these statistics are computed on the individual level and then averaged across the kids. However, uh, in terms of the, of the mean performance, the, the fusion of different modalities increases the overall performance of the personalized network. OK, and uh, so what is the utility of this? Huh? Yeah. So uh, I was curious about the synchronization of different modalities. So what is the temporal resolution uh, you are using there? So uh, by fusing all the modalities, uh, we take the benefit of each of them, uh, which can be seen from the average results. Uh, but if you look at the individual modality, or for example, body was the most informative for this task uh, across all three metrics followed by face and then autonomic physiology data. Audio, we didn't uh, perform well here. No, my but question is like, yeah. Uh -huh. So what was like that temporal resolution? So for, for example, audio and physiological data, yeah. they might not be in the same temporal uh, resolution, right? So yes, they, they are, so everything uh, in this work, everything was synchronized to the frame level. So if you get like a 25 frame, we had 25 frames per second. So everything, uh, all the features were extracted in a way that it would be assigned to these uh, timestamps of the frames. Thanks. Yeah, but uh, in terms of the audio signal, we, we used a window that would capture enough contextual information around that frame in order to be informative enough. So is, it, is the frame level the right level to do this temporally? Uh, you, can, you, can do, you can recompute the measures based on every other frame, every fit frame. Yes, uh, I mean, we can. Uh, there is a, uh, another work uh, that we did. I don't know if I, uh, I'll, I'll try to show a few slides uh, on that, where we discretized these emotional levels, and then we looked into five seconds intervals, which was more contextually meaningful uh, for uh, when you're trying to recognize discrete levels of engagement, for example. Yeah, but here, the notations that we were given uh, uh, were synchronized, uh, were given on the frame level because the annotators were watching the audiovisual recording, so each frame would be assigned a, a certain level of valence, arousal, and engagement. But I agree, yeah. So temporal resolution can, uh, can, be, can vary, and that's another dimension to explore here, what would be the optimal window to capture the, the meaningful signal, more meaningful signal here. Uh, but so uh, in terms of the utility, so we, what we developed here is like a, uh, this real-time monitoring tool that can, the therapist can use to see in real time, you know, uh, uh, from the camera, from all the sensory inputs, 
Uh, what is the level of valence uh, arousal and gauges on the continuous scale? So the blue one is the estimated one by the model, and the red one is the one given by the human therapist. And uh, what is very interesting that is we found this example where the, the trend of the, the estimated signal follows very well the slope of the, of, the, of the ground truth provided by the human therapist, which, is, uh, which usually uh, happens when... Okay, the, the child moves the face, but having taking into account the whole context, it is still very challenging to detect this uh, these changes in the signal. And the model successfully identified that part. Also, these are additional uh, features that are provided by the uh, the wristband. So, by looking at all these metrics, the therapist can a new therapist, for example, who doesn't have much experience, can see in real time what is happening there. But what is uh, even uh, where is even this more useful is uh, when we want to do uh, to have intelligent interaction with the robot, we can use these parameters to modulate the interaction to inform the robot about the effective states and engagement of the kid, so then the, the interaction can be designed in a way that could facilitate engagement, but also the therapy summarization. So by looking into these statistics, by running the when the therapy is finished, so instead of having a therapist who's going to sit there for hours and go through these audiovisual recordings, we can have a summary, automatic summary of these uh, uh, metrics, given like for each phase of the therapy, and then the therapist can look into this and say, okay, so the kid was very engaged in the phase one, and uh, but not in the phase two, so I should modify the phase two of the therapy. So and the bars that you see here are the average estimates for like a one therapy session uh, and one kid obtained by the model and uh, by the human coders. Mm -hmm. So in the, there is a good match in terms of engagement and arousal. In this specific example, in the valence, we didn't achieve that match. But there is a potential to, in, to improve this. So just to summarize, uh, the reason why I decided to talk about this and why I'm very excited about this work is that uh, this is the first uh, work that uh, we did in real world conditions, working with the therapist and achieving uh, uh, and showing that that we can uh, build a system that really works. It's not giving us the highest uh, uh, performance in terms of the balance arousal and engagement estimation, <laughs> but it gives us some uh, the uh, estimates that are very consistent uh, with the human uh, labelers. And this is something that we want to achieve. And of course, we can improve this. But what is important uh, is that we show here that it is feasible to do this kind of uh, uh, machine learning estimations uh, in real world environments. And in a very challenging environment, when working with uh, autistic children, where this heterogeneity is very pronounced. Uh, then this tool has uh, 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 real uses like monitoring of the therapy, but also the summarization of the therapy. Of course, uh, some questions were raised during the talk. So uh, there are limitations. The model is user dependent at the moment. However, uh, and it's static. It doesn't take the temporal information into account. But by changing the network layers from uh, static layers to LSTMs, we, cannot, uh, we can deal with that. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is the negative transfer, is how we prevent the network of downgrading the performance of the population network when trying to generalize to the new kid through the personalization process. So <clears throat> I'll stop at this part here. And if we have a few minutes, I would like to just uh, uh, take a step back and just give you like a, a big picture about all the work uh, uh, that uh, uh, about the big picture about where I see this work going uh, like in the future. So. This is an example of an AI system, where a general system where we have uh, steps like we start with information sensing. We do the machine learning, and then we perform some intervention or interaction here by providing the by using the machine learning outputs to provide the personalized therapy nudges uh, or uh, have a more socially intelligent interaction. And then we are in this loop, and the whole idea is to have this system that is constantly updating over time. And for this. We are not constrained only to autism data. This can be applied to this kind of approach, uh, uh, and uh, like algorithm can be applied to any kind of the data. Of course, there would need to be customization, adaptation of the layers, yeah. the network structures, and so on. But uh, what is uh, uh, what I want to communicate here is that this is applicable to to many different uh, types of data. Uh, 
usually we have the metadata, then we have like the prior knowledge about the users, then we can use any kind of hardware that would allow us sensing of the behavioral data. And uh, at the top, we have the self-reports, expert feedback, user feedback. So making, using machine learning to arrive from this passively observed data to the, to the metrics that we want to achieve uh, can be achieved with this kind of models by designing the structure and allowing them to personalize the interpretations for each individual. And of course, this is not only constrained to the behavioral data. It can be apl uh, applicable to many other uh, data. For example, <coughs> I applied the similar methods uh, uh, to Alzheimer's uh, forecasting. So when we have the clinical data of the patients, so in, in the case of the Alzheimer's, so we have the clinical data of people go to the study and the idea is to try to, to forecast whether this person is gonna convert to Alzheimer's or not over time. <coughs> But there are, like, the main goals that we want to do to achieve here is to empower the user, to protect the user. <coughs> For example, in the case of like, uh, people who, have <coughs> who live with depression or people who have the risk of heart attack. So these are the cases where we really don't want to <coughs> leave the models uh, to, to play with the average performance. We want to make sure that we are doing very well for each and every individual. Because in the case of the human-robot interaction, if this robot fails to estimate the engagement, provides some average estimates, it's fine. The interaction will continue. But in these cases, where people uh, have uh, suicidal thoughts or uh, are suffering for the heart disease, we need the models that are highly accurate and personalized. <coughs> and finally, so in the future, for the future direction, so one of the limitations of this uh, model is that, this <coughs> that the learning is stopped after the, the first round of training. So how we can actively learn in order to achieve this continuous personalization? Then how we can scale up and uh, achieve data uh, while assuring the data privacy? And finally, how we can efficiently deploy this model and enable them to explore the context in which they are applied? Because engagement in one context can have a completely different meaning uh, from another context. And so is there, are there any questions at this point? Because I would need only a few minutes to, to show you one very interesting piece of work if you have time. Um, so I guess I was just wondering, if you think about going beyond um, sort of aggregate performance over the population, then it's not just about whether your model uh, can have uh, parameters for every individual or not, but it's also about what, what kind of metric you're optimizing, right? And as far as I understand, you're still optimizing an average uh, loss across all the users, or is, is the loss function also changing in some way to reflect that you really want to get the problem right for So every all the metrics that uh, I, I showed there uh, were uh, averaged across the users, and the variance was across the users. So, no, I, I mean uh -huh. the, the metric that's actually being optimized, right? So I'm, I'm assuming you're still taking this uh, network and optimizing something like it's uh, cross entropy loss or mean squared error uh, in prediction across all the different individuals in your data set, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so, so at the moment, yeah, so these metrics are still uh, metrics that are like uh, used uh, for the population level models. Mm -hmm. The only way how they are summarized is different. But I agree, I agree, so there should be, like, uh, in an ideal uh, case, we would assign different costs, for example, for mislabeling engagement for this individual than for another. So th th there should be, like, a, yeah, a co cost sensitivity that is also user specific. Yes? Just a clarification question. So you, when you're saying user, do you mean the kids or the therapist? Because I thought in your problem setting, uh, so uh, in this case, I'm uh, uh, referring to the kids. Yeah. Uh, uh, if I uh, so the kids in this uh, case are uh, can be thought of as users uh, of the robot. So in that uh, sense, the robot wants to estimate the engagement of the kid, and the kid is the user. Yeah. So this is the work that I recently done with the Cynthia uh, Brazil's group, uh, personal robots group uh, uh, in Media Lab. And we said, OK, we have these models, but now we, we are working towards putting them uh, in the field of trying to incorporate this perception module uh, into uh, a real robot so that uh, we can estimate engagement uh, uh, on the fly and modulate interaction with the robot. That's something that we are working on now. Uh, the model that we designed for this is 
so this is just to give you a context about the data. So there is a learning activity. So the kid is interacting with the robot. And the robot is uh, here as a tutor and uh, learning companion. So we have 43 uh, kids uh, that uh, we recorded for eight sessions over three months. And uh, for this, we have discrete coding of the engagement levels, but on the five seconds intervals. And these engagement levels are defined like a low, medium, and high. So these are typical kids, and uh, the main idea is that this robot, uh, that we enable this robot to recognize their engagement level so that it can adapt this uh, whole interaction. So uh, no, not at the moment, so because we are now uh, putting these modules into the robot so that we can use this data. We are using this data to learn from the previous interactions uh, how to estimate the engagement so that in the new interactions, the robot can start off with those models and adapt as soon as we have uh, a few sessions uh, going on. So, and this is the model that uh, we propose here. So we use the framework of uh, reinforcement learning for that to do the active learning from, uh, from the data during the interactions. So we have this like uh, five seconds intervals as input to the network that we process using convolutional neural networks. And then this is the most important part. This is here we do the active learning. So we use the LSTM layers, fully connected layers that we model uh, within this window, each of the frames. And then we fuse their outputs to get uh, the action uh, in the output of the model. But the action can take different values. One is I'm uncertain about this video segment, and I need a label. So I'm not going to make an engagement prediction. Or if I'm certain about uh, the content, then I'm, gonna, I'm not going to ask for the label, but I'm going to output the engagement level that I think that, is, uh, that the kid is uh, having in this specific video. If the label is requested, it is put in the pool. And then after the, the session uh, with the kid is finished, the teacher looks at these videos, assigns the labels, and then before the next session, we update the models uh, so that we have a more effective model in the next interaction. The idea is that uh, through several interactions, we can converge with these models and have a fully personalized model. By the way, how fast is it? Is you're learning a personalized policy. How, how fast it is? And the learning process. So uh, the learning, uh, the most of the time of the learning process uh, takes uh, uh, takes uh, during the the learning of the group policy, where we need to have the data of training kids. Like a, so let's say the group policy. How, how? The, the, the model is initialized using the group policy. Yes, the model is initialized using the group policy, which is learned from the training kids. So we split these forty-three kids into uh, twenty-two kids uh, for training and 21 uh, for learned, testing. Uh, the group policy is learned using supervised learning. Right? No. Yes, yeah, so uh, learned using the supervised learning uh, during the training stage. But then when you have a new kid coming in uh, in the test stage, we apply the, the learn policy. And then over time, as more data we are getting from that uh, new kid, uh, we are fine tuning the policy to that new kid. Uh, Unfortunately, I will not go in, uh, so, through these equations. Just uh, to mention, so the loss that we use is standard reinforcement learning loss. It's a Bellman loss when we, when we, minimize, <coughs> where we uh, minimize the loss between the expected actions and the actions that would minimize the future rewards. Uh, uh, and those rewards are defined. Uh, so if the model predicts well, it's plus 1. If the model predicts, uh, gives a wrong prediction of the engagement level, it's minus 1. And then if the model is requesting a label, there is a penalty for that. So this, is, uh, this reward is modulating the learning process in, in, in the model. But the most interesting part here is the adaptation of the model. So we start with this group policy. And then from this whole inter uh, interaction session, we identify what are the segments that the model is uncertain about. We put them in the pool. The human annotator looks at this. And usually, what we found uh, from the, uh, is that there are only like a six percent of the clips that are uh, that model requests the labels for. So, which means, on uh, uh, in the case of uh, uh, like a fifteen minutes uh, uh, sessions, 
only like around one minute. Uh, actually, it would be uh, six, yeah around one minute of the videos would need to be manually annotated, which would uh, take like uh, five minutes to a human coder to do this coding. So it's a very efficient way to to easily adapt the model to the specific kit. And then we, we proceed. We update the policy. We apply it to the new session. Then we get the new videos and so on over time. Yep. Is the robot's goal to say things that engages the kid? Yes. So the robot is designed, but the robot at the moment is not using these estimates to to interact with the, with the kid. And this is a study that we are organizing now, where we are putting this module and then. In real time, uh, testing the, the robot's responses. Yeah? It seems that the reward function is only like whether the robot can predict the engagement level, but there's no maximization of the engagement level. There's no reward that the robot is more engaging. Uh, yeah, uh, so just a second. So let me see why is that. Yes, so if the uh, robot is pre uh, predicts engagement correctly, then it gets a positive reward. Yes, so now the robot can have a policy where it doesn't engage with the kid at all, and it can predict very correctly. So this is an, uh, another type of policy. So this is uh, the policy uh, that is concerned about the interaction. So whether this <coughs> interaction that is designed uh, as part of this tutoring system is engaging or not for the kid. <coughs> So it's a completely different part. So the focus here is on the machine learning part where we are trying to uh, to just get the sense of how engaged the kid is. So it looks like active learning. You're trying so to this is basically it. active learning implemented uh, using the framework of reinforcement learning. Because And the reason why we use here uh, reinforcement learning is uh, that we compared the performance of that model with heuristic strategies, which are usually, so we are giving the videos and we are performing the random sampling or entropy or least confidence. So this random, uh, these heuristics, they try to identify what are the most uncertain samples for this classifier in this pool of the videos, and then ask for the label for those. But again, because we are dealing here with the individuals, there is no one of these strategies that works best for every individual, and there is, it's difficult to adapt these strategies uh, to, uh, through the personalization process. Uh, by having this parametric model implemented using reinforcement learning, we can adjust the parameters of that model so that we adapt it and personalize it to that target kit. And so what, what, uh, what you can see here is the results of different sessions in terms of the accuracy and F1 score for predicting engagement low, medium, high. And init model is the global model. Uh, random is what we get with our model when we do the random sampling from this uh, data without any policy. And RL is, something, is what we get after personalizing the policy after each session. So there is a clear improvement in the performance for each kit. But, uh, and also we can see that the number of the requests can vary from one session to another. So in an ideal scenario, this would converge over time. However, in practice, what is happening is when the kid comes to the session, every time the kid takes a different uh, uh, position uh, at the table or it's wearing a different clothes. So doing this only computer vision approach that, where we use CNNs to directly recognize uh, his limitations. And that's another thing that we are working on now, how we can handle this to have a ro more robust model. So between the random and the RL policy, you are ensuring that it's asking for the same number of labels? So that, that's very important. Uh, so what we did, we uh, in order to compare these methods, and that's a good point. So we did, uh, we computed this average number of requests, and then we we did the sampling of this, and we did the multiple sampling in the case uh, of the random policy, uh, in order to avoid the bias of this uh, specific sample. But we are sure that we have that we are comparing this in the same setting, and. Uh, the, here are the baselines achieved by LSTM model showing that that. The, these different strategies vary from session. Their performance varies from session to session. So we are it, we are happier in this case by having like a policy that is data driven, and then can adapt these parameters over time. Then having to manually select what is the best uh, heuristic policy for this specific case. Uh, this performance is for predicting the engagement level. 
This performance is for predicting the engagement level. It's for predicting the engagement, yeah. But before it predicts, it there's also this prediction of am I predicting or am I yeah. to say so I'm certain. What you're seeing here is uh, uh, the results are uh, reported only on this portion of the data that is uh, not uh, used for, uh, uh, that is not requested for uh, labels. And because we are dealing with only 6%, this is a very small uh, portion of this data that are, for which we are not predicting because the model is requesting the labels. Yeah, uh, but they were taken out when computing these metrics. Do we have a sense of how good they are at predicting when to not label but ask for more labels? Like when are we good? Uh, can we have a ah, sense of when yes, they... Uh, and the, we, uh, I didn't include that result here, but uh, we have that in the paper. We show, because uh, we have uh, in the paper we have uh, three metrics. Uh, one is uh, uh, accuracy, F1 score, but also the precision. And the precision is telling us, in the case of uh, 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 whether you were predicting or not, what were what was the accuracy on all this uh, data, including the the ones that you ask uh, uh, the label for. Do you happen to remember? Is there a continuous chunk in the session where it says I'm uncertain or are the frames spread out where it is? So there is no, te uh, if you mean uh, uh, like te temporal correlations uh, between the data? No, we didn't take that into account. Each of these five seconds interval was uh, treated independently. So we had like this sliding window that was going from the beginning to the end of the session. Hmm? Did you compare? the reinforcement learn strategy directly with those uh, hard-coded strategies? Yes. So, so, but it's a different model compared to them, right? Uh, uh, so what we have, so it's, uh, the, the base model is the same. Ah, so so we, we used the same model, only in the output, <coughs> it was uh, all providing the labels instead of requests. So it was saying, uh, it was directly predicting the engagement levels, <coughs> but it wasn't, uh, and then based on the certainty of this output, we use these uh, strategies to select what data to, to use to update the model. So if you, so if I have it, so, so this model, instead of uh, using it for enforcement learning, we applied it as a supervised model uh, for the comparison methods. And then based on the output of that model, we would apply the heuristic strategies to select what instances to take to uh, to request the label for in order to update the parameters of this model. So that was the only way we could uh, uh, fairly compare uh, the, this as a baseline with the, with the reinforcement learning approach. Okay. And finally, so this is individual performance that uh, uh, where in this table, uh, uh, what I want to show is how the performance deviates from the group level policy. And on the y-axis, we have the children IDs. And on the x-axis, we have the, the session numbers. And as you can see, for example, for the kid with the ID 5, we have uh, improvements that, are, that can go even to 96%. Uh, in terms of the accuracy uh, due to the personalization. However, there are some kids where we have like a very strong negative transfer. And when we looked deeper into why this is happening, we found that for, this happened for the kid that, that was analyzed in completely different contexts. So in the first, in one of the sessions, the kid was sitting on this side of the table. In the other side, it changed the school room, so it was in a different setting. So we are dealing here with something more than just personalization. It's a context adaptation. And this is beyond the scope of uh, uh, like applicability of this model. So this model is designed for a certain setting. Uh, and of course, when we change the setting completely, we're going to have this uh, uh, strong decrease in the performance. When, uh, I'm uh, very close to. To, to closing the talk. So one of the very important uh, things here is also like how we do scale up these kind of systems and uh, uh, assure the data privacy. So there is a framework of, uh, that, that we named RoboChain that I did in collaboration with the Human Dynamics Group in MIT, where we said, OK, we have this group of different robots, or you can think of these personalized models being designed, being 
designed in different sites, different hospitals, different schools, or different homes. And then instead of learning, uh, sending all this data to one uh, huge personalized model, we can distribute this learning and learn the parts of these models in different sites without sharing the, the, personal, data, the personal data. So that's a, uh, a very important because we want to preserve the privacy of these users. And in the case of the medical data, this is uh, even more important. Uh, we propose one method that uses the blockchain uh, to, to document the history of these transactions of the model updates. So that uh, uh, the, if in the case we have an intruder, we can verify whether that member is part of the network and whether these parameters have been stored, uh, produced by this ho uh, hospital network, or there are fake parameters that were inserted by the intruder. However, for the personalized learning, we don't need to use the, the, the blockchain. We can use a standard database, but just distribute the, uh, distribute the learning and use something like federated learning. To, to achieve the, the, the joint learning of these models. Finally, how we efficiently deploy these models. Uh, instead of learning uh, <coughs> all these models simultaneously, we could have uh, like expert models and then allow each expert to model each specific user. So, but one of the questions is how we include a new user. And this is uh, another work that we did on personalizing the expert models, where we, train the, uh, where we treat each individual as one expert. And then we have a gating function, which is uh, deciding based on the data of a new user what weights to assign to each expert when predicting the, the personalized estimates of that user. And to, to find those weights, we use a few label data of the target subject. And the, the idea was that we showed here that we can, again, achieve uh, large improvements. The red one is after the personalization. The, the gray one is before the personalization of, before, uh, by using just the, the network that doesn't uh, uh, adapt the weights to the, in the mixtures. And as you can see, for most of the users, we have the clear improvement, large improvements in terms of the, uh, of the of the measure that we use here, which is another uh, agreement measure concordance correlation coefficient, which we use for this data set because it's very specific for the uh, for, for those data. And finally, uh, how we can efficiently deploy this uh, like on the user devices, so for example, mobile phones or like uh, home computers, instead of having constantly to train all the, uh, this huge network uh, on our hardware. So can we do it somewhere on the cloud? And then just once we have this huge network, can we just distill that part that is of relevance to the specific user and then use those parameters to run that model locally uh, on our own hardware or any device that, that, that we are using, but it is, it is not very powerful in terms of the hardware uh, capacity. So this is one of the approaches that I'm really excited now that I would like to work on. So how to efficiently to enable this joint learning, but to efficiently extract this minimum uh, amount of like this minimal network that can run on any device. And I will close here with, uh, with the, something that I believe is one of the most important aspects in the personalization is the context. And, uh, Personalizing the models and analyzing this data, human data, uh, it's very context dependent. Because by, without knowing the context, the uh, we are left to interpretations most of the time. And in order to achieve like a, to a good estimate of target metrics, we need to be informed of what is the context we are dealing with. In, and because that will inform us whether the model will perform well or not, or what is the meaning of the things we are trying to predict. And for that, we need to take uh, beyond different modalities, we, we need to know not only who is the user, but what is the, user, what is the environment where the user is interacting in. And thank you so much for your time. And uh, If you have any questions, like. Okay, so I have a question about the reward function. <coughs> um, so you. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, so basically, my question is: It looks like okay. So um, you were saying that if you request the label, then the humans uh, on the next slide, the humans were providing the labels, right? Basically, I was uh, yep. it was unclear to me if the ground truth was available or not, because uh, being able to provide the reward for. Um, Oh. An engagement label it seems to suggest that you have the ground truth available. Yes. So during, uh, in order to learn the policy uh, from training data, uh, we need to have the fully labeled data set. Because, because uh, uh, the model would ask for the uh, During the learning, the model may ask or may not for the label of that specific example. And in the case the model asks for the label, in order to facilitate the learning, we need to provide a label for that one. Yeah, so I, I was just, uh, I was puzzled because at training time, it seems that um, you, when you're requesting the label, you don't actually need a human in the loop because you already have a fully labeled data set, I'm assuming? Yes, yeah. Um, but then outside of training time, uh, like when you're actually using this uh, with data later, I'm not sure. I, I see, it makes sense that you would request it from the user, but then how do you compute the reward for if uh, the model actually gives you a prediction? Uh, let me understand. Uh, so if we go back to the reward mm -hmm. function, how do you compute? Oh, sorry. The, bo the bottom two, uh, the reward of it being correct or incorrect, um, when not at training time, but afterwards? Uh -huh. So what happens during the inference time mm -hmm. is that the model is not a rec so uh, th this is uh, uh, this rewards only the the, past of the part of the cost function uh, that is used for learning, mm -hmm. for training the model. So during inference, uh, the model will ask for the label, and then it just stays as a request. But uh, the label uh, is not provided until the human steps in and provides so, it. So if it makes a prediction, then uh, is there any reward provided? At Inference time, or are you just ro are you just running it forward and not worrying about reward no. at all? At, at the inference forward. time, it's a completely like uh, yeah. Okay, we have gotcha. these four outputs. It's a four output neural network okay. that is uh, yeah predicting uh, these bits. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're not doing any like online learning. learning. No. Yeah. So we are not. So that's another interesting uh, point. Like so, how we can uh, based on uh, by knowing that the robot is doing well, how we can uh, reward that even better, and uh, the, there is a concept of uh, like a personalized rewards. Because what we defined here are, again, the rewards that are uh, shared across all the individuals. But of course, like, uh, we would like that metric to be personalized to each individual so that we can assign different rewards. For some kids, it's more difficult to predict engagement levels. And for some, it's more expensive to ask for the label than for the others. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I didn't get like why you couldn't directly compare the reinforcement learning method to the active learning heuristics. Uh, so, well, we, we did it. We, uh, yeah, but you said they're not directly comparable. Uh -huh. No, no, because uh, the output of this uh, uh, of the reinforcement learning method uh, is different. So it tells us whether to request the label or not, uh, and if not, then uh, this is the prediction. So, in the case of uh, these other strategies, we need to have. We, we need to have a model that only gives the predictions, and based on the uncertainty of these predictions, we either uh, ask for the label for that example or not. Right. So we are, uh, but the, the most important thing is the model structure is the same. The only the, uh, the number of the outputs uh, is different. I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's uh, if that completely answers your question, but let me here again. It's here, so. So for the LSTM's uh, uh, approach with the active learning, so we would just have this part here, and then based on the uh, uncertainty levels, which would be the, based on the output of the softmax, we would apply the active learning strategies <coughs> that would tell us, OK, out of this whole pool of the data, these are the top and uh, uh, uncertain examples in the case of uh, uncertainty sampling. And then would ask for the label for those. Thanks. Thank you.